Thank you very much for spending a few more minutes with us after this inspirational panel discussion tonight, which was focusing on this digital transformation process, how the universities can navigate those shifts, maybe tectonic shifts. From your perception, uh, being with EDUCOPS and, and, and really noting what's going on in, in the US in particular, how do you think are universities prepared to navigate through this transformation? Universities are preparing to navigate through this transformation. And I would say that few are prepared today. Our research indicates that only 13% of universities are embarking on a digital transformation program right now. But almost a third as many are starting to, and 37% are exploring it and planning it. The different uh, sorts of preparation that are needed are challenging because universities have to change their technologies, bring in a lot more emerging technologies, do more with analytics and machine learning and AI. But there's also additional changes that need to happen in culture, the entire culture of the institution and in the institutional workforce. Now the changes in the culture really are that we have to move from a culture that is optimized at the individual department level to a culture that is optimized at the institutional level. Because digital transformation is about the transformation of the institution. We have to move from a culture that really takes its time to make decisions and is very, very risk averse to one that can make decisions quickly and is willing to take risks, calculated risks, in the name of innovation. So those are some of the cultural changes that, that we need to have. I'm completely with you uh, mm -hmm. that these challenges are right there. Uh, we are wondering in Germany who or yeah, let's, let's start with the who. Who is the agent, the change agent within the institution that is maybe um, offering support for the navigation? And what are maybe um, examples where uh, institutions speed up? Uh, how do they do that? How do they reform their structures and processes? Do you have any uh, examples for that? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to give examples. In terms of who's in the driver's seat, um, I think I, 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 I think that multiple people need to be in the driver's seat. You absolutely have to have the very top leadership of the university committed to digital transformation because it, it really takes uh, an institutional commitment. But you also need the, the provost, the chief academic officer, who is really sold and willing to provide leadership. You need the chief financial officer who's willing to provide leadership and think about how we can start funding innovation. You need to have the chief HR officer who can help really remake the workforce. And then, of course, the chief information officer is really key to this. One of the things that we're seeing with the CIO role is we're seeing the CIO role, and, and I'm oversimplifying it because it's different at each institution, but the CIO role is also in many ways very often taking on leadership for the data part of the enterprise as well. At some institutions, those roles are separated. But at some institutions, there's join, they're joined because data really needs to be digitized and digitalized for transformation to take effect. Now, in terms of examples, you asked me to provide some examples. One of the things that we are seeing is, is that, that I think is interesting and a great illustration of the way institutions are, are embarking on digital transformation now is we are seeing that they're doing the business of, of running technology services as they have always been. But what they're doing it, it what they're doing now is they're running technology services, ser services with a transformational end in mind. So one example, 
the uh, California Community College System. On 112 campuses throughout the state of California, serving over 2.1 million students. This is a very big enterprise, but it's 112 different colleges. What they did was they got together, these 112 colleges, and they said, you know, I bet we could save money and do some interesting things if we standardized on a single course management system. So think about the change management, the leadership that's entailed in simply making a change like that. That's not transformative. That's certainly, uh, it's simplifying your infrastructure. It's efficient, it's cost effective, but that in and of itself doesn't, doesn't do anything transformative. However, having standardized on a single course management system, what they're able to do now is something that is moving in a transformative direction. They have enabled any of these 2.1 student, million students, no matter which of the 112 campuses they are at, to be able to take any of the online courses offered by any of the other campuses and, and enroll in them and get credit for them, for, for their degree from their institution. So that's a great example of some of the beginnings of digital transformation that we're starting to see today. Digital transformation in higher education is just beginning. I can't tell you where it's gonna lead. Nobody can, and that that's, means it's an exciting time to watch the transformation. But what we can do is we can say, you need to change your culture, you need to change your workforce, you need to change your technology. We're really gonna take that home with us, so that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I wanna jump into discussing it much further, but just to uh, allow me to elaborate, uh, or ask you to elaborate on one more point, because mm -hmm. you mentioned the, um, the crucial, uh, pivotal importance of data, and how the institutions might pick up on, on them, and how right. they can fa facilitate, make research, use it, apply it, um, have also the competencies to deal with it. To cut it short, my question is, um, what's the role of collaboration with tech companies uh, in terms of data management? Where do you see the best fit uh, for academia, uh, higher ed institutions to handle, um, let's say, the, the power of uh, tech companies on that end? Mm -hmm. Um, I, think that, I, I, I think that a lot of tech companies now are doing, starting to do some amazing things with AI and machine learning. There are a lot of opportunities for collaboration between our universities and technology companies. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a few examples. One is simply uh, the, the basic housekeeping of getting our data in order so that we can really apply artificial intelligence, machine learning, and analytics means that we have to take the data that now, as I said earlier, it has been optimized at the departmental, at the individual function level. It is stored all over the place diff in different formats, in different systems that don't talk to one another for different purposes. And so the systems don't necessarily talk to one another. The data don't necessarily talk to one another. So a big undertaking in higher education today is trying to integrate those data. We are seeing now even progress from a year ago in digital integrations where there's integration software that has come, uh, has, has come into place that automates and simplifies many of the integrations that used to have to be manually programmed. So a, another great area for vendors would be for them to come in and try to further automate this and simplify it for the academic system. So, so that's, that's one example. Um, another example is um, in, in a couple of different directions. Uh, some campuses are using Amazon's devices, um, like, like it's um, Alexa, uh, a voice assistant, and putting those in dormitories so that students can communicate with campus services via voice. 
Um, and Google is uh, just released, right, today announced a whole bunch of other consumer devices. Think about the potential partnerships between these consumer device technology companies that are using data and analytics to help us make good choices and, and interesting choices as consumers. Imagine bringing that to our campuses and helping to increase smart campuses, but also trying to think about how these could apply to student success. So that would be a really interesting conversation to start. And then finally, there are a lot of technology companies that are trying to provide um, holistic, out-of-the-box student success services for student advising and planning and learning analytics and the like for campuses that can't afford to be able to figure it out on their own. That's very interesting. That seems to be the potential side, let's say. And mm -hmm. you know, we are from Germany, so allow us to, to also play the, the concern side. Yes. Um, where do you think, think is the, the limit or the, um, the risk uh, of dealing with uh, uh, yeah, uh, external partners that may also utilize, uh, commercialize data or have other objectives yeah. than uh, higher academics, uh, <laughs> higher ed academia has? So what, what do you think about this part? I'm really glad that you asked that because that's incredibly important. We, we get stars in our eyes when we talk about new technologies and, and we think about all the wonderful things that they can do. And somehow uh, we, lose, we, we lose our remembrance of things past. Uh, and, and we think, well, nothing bad could ever happen because all I can imagine are the wonderful things. And we know that inevitably, every time we introduce a new technology, that there will be as many dark uses of it as there will benign and positive uses of it. What, what, in, what institutions can do right now is they can think about privacy and they can do what they need to do to be able to safeguard students' privacy. What do they need to do? The first thing they need to do is they need to know where their data are, right? And in many cases, we don't. I, I, would, I would venture to say in most cases, we don't. We need a good inventory of the data. We need to know where it is, where it's going, who has it, and what it's being used for. And then aware, and, and, and institutions know this now, so they're very focused on data governance so that they can really understand where the data are headed. And they're also focused on how they can provide privacy assurances to students because students need to know what data they're giving up and how they're being used. And they need safeguards put in place. But it goes a step further. It also goes to making sure that when we work with vendors, with solution providers, we understand what they're doing with our data. Very often we ask them the naive question, well, who owns the data? It's still my data. And the companies will say, well, of course it's your data. That's the wrong question. The question that I have is, how long are you going to keep those data? When are you going to get rid of them? And who owns the algorithm, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not about the data. The value is really in the algorithm and what you do with the data. So we're starting to see, as we move into analytics and AI, we're starting to see talk not just of data governance, but of algorithmic governance. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to continue this dialogue. Thanks for tonight's event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Oliver. Thank you for inviting me.